Kyle, I'm just going to give it a couple of seconds. Uh, wait until people join here, and then we'll get started. Hi, I'm Margaret O'Neill. I'm the Director of Programs at CNU, and I want to welcome you all to On the Park Bench, a public square conversation brought to you by the Congress for the New Urbanism. On the Park Bench presents interactive conversations from thought leaders in new urbanism and allied industries, providing an opportunity for the audience to engage in real time. The webinar series is intended to be a weekly platform for CNU members to engage and debate and discuss and collaborate on pressing issues um, that we're all facing right now. If you'd like to hear from something, hear from someone specific or talk about something in a future on the park bench, please let me know and we'll try to line it up. Today's conversation is Bring Back Main Street with Small Scale Manufacturing, the Who, the Why, and the How. We'd love that you could share your thoughts and on the park bench here. There's a little bit of a feedback um, survey available if you guys want to do that in the future. Um, and then here I am to introduce today's speaker, um, Alana Proust, is um, the founder and CEO of Recast City and author of upcoming book, Recast Your City, publishing um, in the next year or so. She's also the co-author of Discovering Your Maker Economy and Made in Place, Small Scale Manufacturing and Neighborhood Revitalization. Through Recast City, she partners with local leaders to bring back bring Main Streets back to life and bring businesses back to downtown and build an inclusive and resilient economy. She's passionate about making great spaces, um, sees small scale product and businesses are missing a missing piece in today's uh, mixed use development, commercial property repositioning and local economic development strategy. Her passion for great places grew out of her experience working in big and small cities all over the country when she led the technical assistance program at the US EPA Smart Growth Program, and as well as her experience as the Vice President and Chief of Staff at Smart Growth America. I'm going to hand it off to Alana and let her wow you with her presentation. Thank you so much, and I'm really excited to be here today and to have um, so many great participants on the list, a lot of great uh, familiar names and friends and, and colleagues of your uh, flying by. So I'm, I'm really excited to join the conversation. Thank you to the Congress for the New Urbanism for, for hosting me today. I'm going to share my screen and then um, we can start this whole conversation. And I do talk about it as a conversation because um, it's the only way we make change in our community is by conversations with more people, with people we haven't spoken to before, um, and, and really having those and conversations in an open way is essential to that outcome. So um, we're gonna talk about how do we bring Main Street back to life with small scale manufacturing, um, but this is obviously the new urbanist version. Um, and what I wanna leave you with today and, and is really five specific things that you can do, that we can all do as new urbanists to really um, take on a community um, in a new way and in a different way that's really essential um, at this point in our work. So if I can move my slides, it's gonna help. So um, first of all, welcome. Thank you for being here today. I'm really excited, as I said, to be on the park bench with you um, and have a chance to chat with you. I'm going to um, give a presentation for the first portion of this, but then we're going to really open it up to questions. So please remember that you can submit questions at any point along the way um, under the Q&A button and um, we'll take them all at the end and go through them as much as possible. I know you guys know all about what it means to make great places, and that's, that is the basis of CNU and its members. Um, but I, I, I always think about what it means to have the personality of places, right? We, we know this inherently, that, that each place has a unique personality and that they thrive based on that unique personality. Um, but also places have lost that um, and lost that in the past and really struggled. And that when we think about, or when I think about new urbanism, I think about both the existing places that we can bring back to life, as well as the new places that we can create. On top of that, we've had this um, reality, this, this emergency, this, this really this awful uh, series of events this year, um, the pandemic of COVID-19, and it's impacted people's lives. Um, we've lost, at this point, almost 200,000 lives. Um, of people in our communities. We've lost um, thousands and thousands of businesses, not only because we were closed for many days permanently uh, or consistently in a bunch of spaces, 
um, but also because of the partial openings and how difficult that's been. So we're starting in a really tough place in terms of the economy. And what I want to do first is talk a little bit about the economic side of all of this, the economic reality that we're operating in to lay that out as a baseline of what we understand and then really position our work in terms of community development in light of that. Right. So we know our reality of COVID-19 is that most small businesses closed for a really long time. Many of them will not survive this. Some estimates are that 20 to 30 percent of small businesses are going to close permanently um, through this pandemic. We also know that millions and millions of people filed for unemployment and that many people are still not back to work, even though those ben the federal benefits have expired. Many people are facing evictions. Um, many people only have part-time work where they had full-time work before. Um, and so that that has a huge impact on people, their livelihood, their family, and the economy overall as well. Before COVID hit, we were already in this really weird time um, in terms of our economy, with some places working really well and some places really struggling. Um, so we already had a, before COVID, we had 80% of all counties already seeing a decline in the working age adult population. So we already had that brain drain, that loss of, of community leadership going on in a lot of places. We also um, are witnessing the greatest income inequality that our country has ever seen since we started tracking it. And that was before COVID, the greatest income inequality we've ever had. And we put on top of that some of the things that we know, I know you guys know this just sort of inherently, right? that vacant buildings on a block reduce the value of nearby properties by 20% or more. So when we think about the loss of that adult population, the loss of businesses, that income inequality, and vacancies on top of that, we start creating this negative feedback loop, right, that really can pull down communities, pull down job security, and pull down the places that we know and love. So I come at this um, really, recommending that we need a different model. We need a different model for how we invest in places, how we invest in our economy. And by pursuing a different model, we can build strong, inclusive main streets and really bring back. Um, if you're in a hot market, it's really about how are we claiming those places for the people who live there um, and addressing issues of displacement. And if we're in cold markets, it's really about how are we building up that economy in that place from scratch. For those of you who don't know me, um, as the wonderful introduction said, my name is Ilana Pruce, and um, I've been in the smart growth world for a really long time. Um, it really, I would say, started with, um, it's my mother's fault, always is. Um, the picture on the left you'll see is a, it's amazing electric blue dress that my mother uh, stitched for me, she sewed for me for high school. Um, and she always taught me that I could use the drill, hang the blinds, fix the thing, um, and that tools were my friend. And um, on the right, you can see a TEDx talk I gave now a number of years ago called The Economic Power of Great Places. So great places um, has always been a part of my work and always been a part of what I believe in um, and that everybody deserves to have a great place and to live in a great place. My other great project is these two crazy teens um, who also know how to use drills and, and, and make things um, but are, are always an entertaining part of my, my project world. Um, so um, as the introduction said, I, you know, I was at the Smart Growth office at EPA and then the, at uh, Smart Growth America and left the Smart Growth America six years ago to start Recast City. And with Recast City, I took everything that I learned from Smart Growth and all the ama amazing people in, in the field, in the broader field, um, and really packed it into this question of how do we create places where businesses can thrive um, that include more people in wealth building opportunity. Um, and I found that small scale manufacturing, a business that creates some kind of tangible good can fit into these storefronts, into vacant storefronts um, and really bring an inclusive community of business owners out to the forefront in our communities. And that's what I've been doing for the last six years is working with local governments, with real estate developers, with nonprofits, um, improvement districts to really bring small scale manufacturing businesses into the projects, into the spaces and into our economic development strategy. It usually has to do with sitting down with people around a table or on the park bench, but obviously these days with COVID, um, it's all over Zoom or other platforms. But I do believe that all of the work really comes down to how are we bringing people together to create these great places. So let me get back to the economic piece that we were talking about. 
places I believe are stuck in a default economic model. And what we're gonna talk about is really how do we ditch that default model? What is that default model? How do we invest in a better way? And then those five steps that I was talking about in the, in the beginning, because I do believe that CNU members and, and new urbanists can really lead the way in a lot of these solutions. So I'm just gonna go briefly over this default model. There are a lot of places that we're dealing with where um, economic development, the economic development model is really left over from the 80s or the 70s. Um, the people are, and places are getting left behind in a number of different ways. Um, and that real estate is being built as a, as a very template model, but not in a good way, in a way that really doesn't represent what's unique or interesting about that place. Right, we're, we're doing a lot of cookie cutter, even if we're doing it in urban areas. So I'm gonna just run through that really briefly. Um, our economic development strategy really is stuck in the 80s. I love the 80s hair bands, but it's not where I want my economic model to be. Um, we have a lot of local economic leaders really chasing biz big business as this one solution for all the economic woes, at a, as opposed to looking at sort of different kinds of detailed solutions. We also have a lot of communities that are trading away their future with recruitment dollars, spending millions of dollars on recruiting big businesses instead of investing in the people or the place that's there now. Um, a lot of these incentives are only for high income jobs and in other places they're actually spending a lot of money on low income jobs where people still have to apply for food stamps, even though it was a recruited job. So the cost of the community is multiple times what the original investment might have been. We know that people and places are being left behind, right? We saw this with the hollowing out of a lot of communities um, in the 70s and 80s. Um, we had this because a lot of our production means of production moved overseas, um, but we haven't in a lot of places figured out how we're reinvesting in those places. Um, and in, in fact, where investment is happening, it's very concentrated. Most of the venture capital funding is still going to Silicon Valley, um, but it really focuses on five major areas um, in terms of investment. We also know that with opportunity zones, the, the opportunity zones are all over the country, but the vast majority of the money going into the, the projects is still in the major cities. It's not benefiting the cities, the smaller cities and towns as much as the bigger cities. Um, and it's certainly not helping address any issues of equity or inclusion in the projects um, in the vast majority of places. So it's creating more of a separation as opposed to addressing it. And then we have an enormous racial wealth gap in our country. And I think it is important for us to acknowledge this and look at how we start solving each of these problems with every one of the solutions that we bring into a community. Um, we know that the racial wealth gap, in fact, has barely narrowed in the last 50 years. It's gone from seven to six and a half, which is just not, an, not a solution. And that it's not because just because of historic injustices, it's because of unequal, unequal incomes now. And so creating space and opportunity for people to build family wealth and for to do that through business ownership becomes an essential part of the work that I believe we need to do within the communities. And then we also have this crazy thing where a lot of people are building vanilla mixed use just like they built vanilla suburban sprawl. Um, we have the same chain stores, we have the same CrossFit, um, and that's on top of the really expensive spread of the peanut butter, I call them expensive peanut butter, the retail that's been spread all over the country, the malls that are hollowing out, um, the requirement for uh, mixed use to always have ground floor retail throughout all of downtown versus really thinking in, in detail about what should have retail ground floor, what should be uh, mixed use adjacent versus mixed use vertical. And then we have really unpredictable approval processes in a lot of community that makes the cost of construction go up. That means that it takes longer to get things approved. And obviously that is part of that cost of development. So um, having that unpredictable nature of the approval process really makes all of this harder as well. So I believe we need to do better. And I do believe that it will take every one of us to get there. And I think that um, there are a lot of things that we can do. And, and there's a, an amazing secret sauce that is obviously not a secret sauce to any CNU member because this is really the basis of what you think about already. Um, but that place is key to economic strength. Investing in a place is key to creating that energy. Um, what is unique about that place is also key to its economic longevity. How does it hold that value? And then social connections, how people connect and how business owners connect becomes key to that economic resilience. And there's actually a lot of research behind 
um, economic resilience and disaster recovery that shows that businesses that have strong connections, personal connections to other business owners are twice as likely to recover from that disaster than people who do not have strong connections. So um, really baking these solutions into the way we create places and the way we invest in places becomes part of the essential piece. And as I said, new urbanism and, and to me, small scale manufacturing, which we're about to get to, um, help us get to all of these pieces. But we need to do it with intention and purpose. And I say this specifically because there are a lot of people being left out of these processes, in, left out of the decision-making process, left out of the design process. And I know that there's a lot of goodwill about creating outreach programs that are inclusive, but I think that there's still a lot of people getting left out and that we have to connect to leaders in all different parts of our community very purposefully to make sure that we're bringing people in and do it sometimes in very different ways. So the new path forward, um, it's really a new path we have to forge to go forward means four different things to me. And this is the basis of my work at Recast City. We need to invest in people who live there, the people who are there now, um, not just the people who we want to attract to a place. We, invest in, we need to invest in the place with those people. What do they need in the place? How do we support them in that place? We need to create a new structure to support and scale and invest in that. Um, and that's both from a real estate side and real estate models, as well as from an economic development side. And we need to think long-term, but we can act now. Um, and there are a ton of short-term actions we can take to start showing people that the place is different, that the actions are going to be different. So how does small-scale manufacturing fit into all of this? Um, this is really a big part of what, what I talk about. It's this missing piece um, that is really a part of the solution in a lot of places. Small-scale manufacturing, as I said, um, is a business that creates some kind of tangible good that can be replicated or packaged. My shorthand is hot sauce, handbags, and hardware. So it's material agnostic. Um, some of them are, are part of a supply chain, right? They might be making a widget for somebody else, but a lot of them are consumer facing. So when we go to, before COVID, when we went to um, vendors and, and festivals, we, we would see all of these vendors who made things in our community, right? And bringing these vendors together gave us a reason to gather. And we know from studies from the Urban Land Institute, from the National Association of Realtors, that people are craving those places to gather and they will be again safely um, after we come out of this crisis. Small scale manufacturing businesses and building a community of them also gives us a new opportunity to build a, an inclusive business community. We know that the representation, the, the diversity of the representation of business community leaders is in fact not that diverse in the vast majority of communities. But if we start from scratch and say, let's build a cohort of leaders in small scale manufacturing, then we can start from scratch. There's nobody that has a vested interest in small scale manufacturing. In very few places is that the case. And so we really purposefully can build from the beginning a, a community of business owners that represents the demographic diversity of our community so we understand their needs and we can promote them and create space for them. These businesses also are phenomenal at filling storefronts. Um, this is a woman who, as you can see, makes soaps and just off to her left is this big cauldron that she uses to make her soaps, pour them into a mold so she can do her production and her retail all in the same space. That's efficient for her as a business owner because she's not paying for extra staff. Um, it's really cool as an experience to be able to see things happening in that space. Um, and it's production and retail in the storefront. So it's really energizing this, this area with the, the stores as well. These businesses can help increase property value too. We talked about the vacant properties before. When they go into a block, a main street, uh, you know, uh, an, either an existing building or new construction, these businesses are really interesting, right? They have energy, something is being made. They, they do connect to that experiential retail that we talked about a lot before COVID and that we will get back to. So this is Zeke's Coffee. It's a coffee shop, but in the back is a, a, a coffee roaster. They do their regional production out the back of this shop. So again, it's production, it's retail, um, it's a, a third place within the community where people can collect. Um, but it also means that this business has multiple revenue sources out of one space to make the business more resilient as well. And it helps increase the property value on the whole block because it creates energy in this one space. And lo and behold, within a year of this business coming onto this block, a number of other spaces were filled. 
The other thing to note is, and this is sort of something that economic development talks about all over the place, is how do we attract more businesses? How do we attract more entrepreneurs? And the truth is, is that the more that we take care of our entrepreneurs and our business owners, the more word gets out. Um, so when we take care of our small scale manufacturing business owners and we really create programming around them and really support them, um, the word gets out. I'll give you Knoxville as an example. Knoxville has done a ton of programming out of the Knoxville Entrepreneur Center to support their makers, which are maker businesses, all sorts of different kinds of businesses that make a product. Those businesses talk to the people they know and Knoxville is really known as a strong destination for people who might be interested in moving locations. And it is attracting more business owners because of the support that they're providing. So all of this really, to me, points to pieces of a thriving Main Street, um, that energy, that gathering, the filling of the storefronts. But I think it's important for you to understand who these businesses are in a really specific way. So I'm gonna run through a few examples of these kinds of businesses and the kinds of spaces that they use so that you can understand that um, for your own projects. First, we'll start with the, from the smallest to the largest. Artisan businesses, maker businesses, pick a name, stick with it. These are generally one person businesses up to about five person businesses. And um, this is Katie Stack, she makes amazing handbags. Her business is called Stitch and Rivet. Definitely worth checking her out. She also has beautiful material for masks um, that she makes. Stitch and Rivet is in an 800 square foot space. They started in a 400 square foot space and, and uh, Katie, started, Katie started on her own and then added uh, employees to her business as she grew. This is an artisan business that needs a small amount of space but can do that production and retail in one space that we were talking about before. We then have businesses that are scaling. So they might be prototyping some kind of hardware, they might be doing small batch production, but they might need a few thousand square feet. And they're generally going to have um, fewer than 20 employees. Um, the top picture is Shinola. At the time I, I pulled this, they were a much smaller business. Um, they're obviously a lot bigger today, um, but there are tons of small batch producers. You can think about businesses in food, in wood, in metal, um, and in hardware as well. Anybody who's producing something that they're creating small batches of, um, they're just starting to scale and need all sorts of different kinds of support. And then we have production at scale in the neighborhood. This might be a bigger business. It might have 50 employees, um, but it fits into an existing building in your neighborhood. And so it's really becoming an asset at a different scale. This is Rheingeist Brewing in Cincinnati. Um, they bought an old brewery building in the old brewery district um, and they left the vast majority of their building um, open because they wanted it to be a gathering place for the community. Obviously things are a little different right now, but that need to gather and that ability to gather around a product business is going to come back and it becomes an essential part of our, our community and, and scaling good paying jobs within our community. Then we have maker spaces. Maker spaces are a really specific kind of space that's open to the community. These are spaces where anybody can come um, and take a class about how to make a specific thing or learn how to use a specific tool um, or can be a member and have access to a whole set of tools. It is open both to tinkerer and hobbyists as well as to small businesses. Um, some of the larger maker spaces have sort of co-work space alongside it so a business can work from there or leave their projects there. Um, but some of them just have the workspace and it really depends from community to community. Maker spaces sometimes are associated with a community college or the library system in the community. Um, and sometimes they're run as independent nonprofits. Very few of them are successful as for-profit uh, endeavors on their own. And then we have shared spaces. So the most well-known uh, type of these are commercial shared kitchens. Um, these are spaces where businesses can come and pay for a, a number of hours a week to create their food product, um, or they might uh, lease a specific bay within the commercial kitchen that has that health stamp of approval. What it means is that when food product businesses are scaling is they don't have to figure out how to get the capital investment to build out their own commercial space. And that becomes an essential part of the answer for them. Um, we also have different kinds of, of shared spaces, shared wood shops, um, different verticals, shared textile spaces. Um, and so that's really specifically for small business owners. It's not open to um, uh, the community members. It's not for tinkers and hobbyists, it's for small businesses only. 
So what does all of this mean for a place, right? And how does this connect back up to what we're trying to achieve? I'm gonna take you through one example. So um, Recast City, we, we actually had a great partnership with Smart Growth America a couple years ago. Um, and we worked with the Loop Community Improvement District um, in, in um, Columbia, Missouri. Uh, this is what it looks like. I know really ex an exciting place, but they, the property owners came together to say, we want it to be more. We don't just wanna be a high traffic area with lots of empty parking lots. We wanna create a place that's an asset for the community. So we worked with them not only having a, a big community meeting on that corridor, um, but interviewing a ton of small scale manufacturing business owners, different connectors in the community, like the, the leaders of the Latino Chamber of Commerce, um, a diversity of business owners who produce things in the community to find out what do they need in a space? What do they need in business development support? Um, we talked to property owners, and we talked to economic development staff, and we talked to um, small business development center or small business uh, support providers within the community as well. And this is all part of the method that what we do. And we go and we visit the small scale manufacturing businesses when it's not COVID time to really understand how their business operates, both from a quantitative as well as a qualitative understanding of that using user research techniques to, to really get into the meat of what, what's going on, what works, what doesn't work, and, and what else do they need if we're really going to support this kind of business in the community. And one of the things that was really exciting to me, not only was working with, with Carrie, who was an amazing person to work with, um, who led the loop, leads the loop, um, was that she recognized that there was this whole economic engine right under her nose, as she said, um, that she could really just tap into as a resource um, for the loop and for its growth. And so one of the things that they're doing, this got delayed a little bit. Uh, the, the opening is, a, is about to happen in the next month or so, um, but they created a commercial shared kitchen and we helped them identify where to do that on the loop based on um, all of the information that we collected from the small business owners, but also how to compare it with the small business support that they need in the location that they need and really create it through a set of partnerships that we helped identify. So how can new urbanists create these kinds of places that are strong and inclusive? And I, I, I am very specific about this because I believe that we, each and every one of us has a responsibility in every piece of our work to figure out how to do this. Um, that no matter if it's a project for ourselves, it's a project for a client, no matter who it is, um, that we need to figure out how to do this. And so I have five steps. Um, and um, after that, I'm going to open it up to questions. So feel free to start putting questions into the question pot, um, uh, link. Um, but, but I want to go through these um, really specifically. So uh, first step is to start with residents and business owners that are rarely at the table. Um, and a lot, of a lot of communities, this might be the black community, um, other indigenous or people of color who live in that community. Um, who have not been included in an effective way in the past. Um, it might have been in a superficial way in the past. And so um, I think it's really important for us to go out and find connectors, people who have the trust of those communities, um, and really bring those connectors into the conversation. It might be a faith leader, a cultural leader, a civic leader, somebody um, who can really help us bring people together. Um, through my work with communities, um, I work with connectors to identify small scale manufacturing business owners who the community or leadership doesn't know automatically so that we can build that inclusive base of um, business owners that represent the demographic diversity of the community. Second, we need to fix the codes. Um, and we can, form-based codes can be a part of the solution in places that don't have form-based codes. It often means going in and adding an approved, uh, amending the code to add a land use, a permitted land use. Um, artisan manufacturing is a land use definition that's been adopted in a lot of downtowns and on a lot of main streets to make sure that artisan businesses can be a part of main street um, where they're in many cases not allowed. Um, and so going in and amending the zoning in very simple ways um, to have a quick fix on that becomes essential. And I think this is even more so right now where we do expect a lot of vacancies in commercial space. So we wanna create as much flexibility that does bring that vibrancy to the storefront um, as much as possible wherever we go. Third, um, we need to create spaces for locally owned businesses with living wage jobs. I know that's a mouthful. I wanna take that apart a little bit. When we create designs or plans with um, commercial space. I don't 
know of many people that think about what kind of space a business with living wage jobs needs versus a retail or a service job and what kind of structure of space um, that that's going to require. I think we need to take that step back and figure out not only what kind of spaces they need, but who they are and how do we bring those businesses into the conversation. Small scale manufacturing businesses not only are an accessible, accessible type of business owner, a business to own, um, no matter what your background is, your education or where you come from, we see it across the board in every part of our community, but the jobs uh, pay better wages. They pay 50 to 100% more than retail or service jobs on average. And so that when we're looking at ways to help really close that wealth gap in our community, this becomes an essential part of the solution. But that means that we actually have to design spaces for these businesses that are affordable and fit their needs. Fourth, we need to design inclusive public spaces for that community. How are we creating the outdoor spaces, that public realm that really brings people together, that really makes everybody feel included? Um, we have a lot of successful main streets in our communities. They, in many cases, do not represent the demographic diversity of that community. And some people feel like they belong there and a lot of people don't feel like they belong there. How do we create those spaces that make people feel included? Um, what is the, the code of the language, of the colors, of the design that really crosses the barriers with, that might be within a community? And then fifth, how are we creating more opportunities for community wealth building within the fabric of a project? Are there ways for people to become owners in part of the building? Um, are there co-op models we wanna pursue? Are there other ways that, that businesses and residents can really build the community wealth as a part of that project? Because we know that um, local ownership, that sense of ownership of the space really becomes essential for its long-term success. So I have lots more I can talk about on this um, any day of the week. Um, if you would like to, to know more, you're welcome to sign up for the Recast City newsletter. Um, you can come find me on LinkedIn. That's where most of my conversations about this um, happen. I'd love to connect with you there. Um, and you're welcome to message me on LinkedIn and, and ask me any follow-up questions there too. Um, you're always welcome to email me directly, uh, Ilana at Recast City. I make myself super available. You know, I think that the thing to, to remember in all of this is that we all are trying to create these spaces where people want to come together, right? That people are proud of um, and where the people who own businesses are really proud of what they're creating in their, in their business and the jobs that they're creating. And all of that comes together in the way we invest in places and the way we design places. And, and the leadership that it takes to create that is essential as well, because we're all just trying to create these great places that people are proud to call home. Um, and I know that that's a common denominator across all of our work. So with that, I will say thank you very much for having me today. Um, and if you'd like to put questions into uh, the Q&A box, I'm happy to take whatever questions you have. Thank you so much. <clears throat> yeah, if anybody has any things they want to add to the Q&A, um, we have a couple of questions coming in, but feel free to keep asking them. Um, I loved to see pictures of some businesses very close to my home, and I've um, been really inspired in COVID times, how it seems like um, kind of the small producers can be um, more creative and more nimble sometimes in the way that they're able to continue to get their services to folks. Um, I know we're gonna have some questions kind of about how um, businesses and producers are um, uh, kind of adapting to COVID, but I'm interested if you can talk a little bit about that kind of generally, um, how you see the concept of kind of manufacturing production, small scale um, being kind of more or less vulnerable when it comes to COVID kind of restrictions, um, whether you've seen across the board some more kind of creative and nimble responses or whether you've seen a little bit more struggle. Yeah, great question. Um, so I believe that small scale manufacturers actually saved the day. Um, the small scale manufacturers across the country pivoted overnight to create the PPEs that we needed um, for our hospitals, for, for us, um, and, and for our emergency responders. Um, the gowns, the face shields, the masks, all of these different pieces um, producing with new materials and high tech stuff. Um, 
there were informal groups that organized to formal entities almost overnight in, in all these different cities to be able to respond to this emergency need where we didn't have those essential needs of the PPEs um, not only not available within our communities, but we had no means of production because it was completely dependent on an import model for that. Mm -hmm. So that part of our supply chain, um, as much as I don't talk about big supply chain stuff all the time, that part of our supply chain um, really saved us. And so I think we have a, a, actually a responsibility to continue to invest in small scale manufacturing businesses that might make all sorts of different things on a regular year, um, but so that they can do that in times of emergency, that there are a redundancy in the systems that we're creating. But those businesses also can be more resilient within a, a pandemic, within this disaster time that we're in because they have multiple sources of revenue. Um, they're not just dependent on storefront sales. They can do so online sales. Um, they can do wholesale. Um, I will say that the people who do production in textiles and clothing are probably suffering more than people who make um, handbags. The, the different parts of the sectors are, are being impacted in different ways. So it's not uniform. Um, but that ability to have multiple sources of revenue coming in really make a big difference in terms of the resilience of that business. That's great, thank you. Um, there's a couple of questions that have kind of come in about this concept of, of the right mix. And I know that, you know, at, <clears throat> in New Urbanism, we often are talking about retail mixes and kind of getting the right mix. Um, and it seems like sometimes, sometimes with the kind of small, um, small scale manufacturing, um, there's kind of an incremental approach to the way that a block will fill out, as you mentioned with one of the coffee shops that you showed. Um, right. Is there a strategy for figuring out kind of the right retail mix for, for a block or a street to make sure that we're kind of making the right opportunities or how do you approach that as a planner and not necessarily, you know, just kind of a, a retail person? Yes, um, it, it's, um, I don't think that there's a one size fits all answer. I think it has to be based on the community and the kinds of businesses that you're finding. Um, the added challenge to that is that in many markets, um, small scale manufacturers can't afford the retail lease rates, right? So that's layered on top of that. It's, it's not only the question of what kind of mix would we want ideally here, um, it's what's affordable. Um, what are the price points that are within that market area? Mm -hmm. um, and, and just like, to me, just like affordable housing has government intervention, I actually think affordable workspace for businesses to stay in a neighborhood and retain good paying jobs in a neighborhood um, is, an, is a public good as well. Yeah. Um, so it depends, right? I mean, we already know that people are looking at restaurants and bars and retail um, mm -hmm. in terms of that ground floor and all the different kinds of retail that can be there. Um, there are some places that, are, that really have looked at all different kinds of small scale manufacturers as an essential part of the answer um, and really creating a diversity of consumer products along that stretch so that you can see all different kinds of things, right? A maker district um, that's not artists, but, but producers um, who are doing the production in that space. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's not like I can say, oh, you need one wood, you need one jewelry, jewelry one, um, it's not going to work like that. Um, it's also going to need to be responsive to who you find in your community who really wants to be a part of Main Street. And that's part of what we do when we reach out to the business owners directly to understand, you know, do they want to be a part of a community of businesses? Do they want to be a part of a community of producers as well? Yeah, and I think that that's interesting too, just broadening your kind of definition of what retail can be to really kind of incorporate new kind of uses and businesses. Um, so along those lines, you know, in terms of affordability, for example, and um, trying to make space, you know, how do you kind of coax landlords um, into being more flexible or are there kind of, you know, model ordinances for kind of making it easier for maker spaces to be incorporated into what we would consider kind of a traditional retail corridor? Right. So a lot of times it's gonna take um, pretty forward thinking property owners or developers. And that's when I work with a community, that's really who I ask about first, is who, who owns property or who's doing development that really believes in the community and is willing to look at something new. Um, and, and we know that that's not everybody. Um, and in some cases that might only be one or two of the property owners in the community or developers in the community. Um, but finding those people and really see if they're willing to try this. Um, it's not high risk, it's just different than what they've done before. 
Um, and in most cases, it's not going to be prime retail. If it's, a, if it's a hot market, there's no way it can be prime retail. Um, but it can be, you know, around the corner from the prime retail, or it can be 20% of the storefronts instead of all of the storefronts, so that it's, or it can be part of the, the developer's negotiation with the, with the jurisdiction. It can be part of what they proffer to the jurisdiction that they'll set aside X amount of square footage to be for locally owned product businesses. Um, mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of different ways of getting there, but but having um, that affordable space becomes an essential part of it. So have you ever, you find that then it's mostly driven by developers, property owners? It's a little bit of both, right? I mean, the other way to get at that as a jurisdiction can say, and, and this has definitely happened both with improvement districts as well as um, community development corporations and jurisdictions. They say, we're gonna take a property we own Mm -hmm. And we're going to do this in the property that we own, right? So um, community development corporations have some, in some communities started to pivot from just doing housing to also creating space for businesses, um, recognizing that they want to keep good paying jobs within their community. And in a lot of different places, they started looking at how do we create a shared building for a whole bunch of small scale manufacturing businesses as a way to do that. Mm -hmm. And that's a really, a really great model to pursue. Um, and in, ca in many cases need some kind of subsidy, right? They use new market tax credits um, or they go after a, a federal grant of some kind to help make that, that pro forma work because it is a, a lower lease rate, um, but it's serving a public good. It's achieving a specific goal for the community. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, there's a couple of questions about kind of um, finding entrepreneurs or letting folks know that you have makerspace available or are interested in doing that. Mm -hmm. Do you have kind of best practices for those instances? Absolutely. Um, and I'm happy to share that if anybody wants to reach out to me directly. I'm, I have a whole bunch of information on that. Um, I think I have a whole blog on that somewhere on my website too. Um, there's a bunch of things to look at. Um, I look at vendors uh, for past public events, um, festivals and fairs. Um, there are a lot of people who start there um, because it's a low risk way to test out not only your marketing, but also what products really sell. And a lot of those businesses, um, a handful of them do end up becoming both full-time businesses and businesses that scale. Um, the other thing to do is to look at, to talk to your small business development center or your chamber, um, ask them who do they know who has a product business um, is there an economic development authority in your area? Do they work with small businesses? Um, it's really what I call retail outreach, not retail stores, but like one by one by one outreach is how we work with communities to find them. Um, and then to reach out to different kind of connectors that I talked about before, um, faith leaders, community leaders, and, and ask them to help spread the word and help find people. Um, the project that we did in Columbia, Missouri, the first thing they did was launch a new website called Como Makes. And every time they talked about the work is they drove people to that website to say, if you make anything, you know, sign up here. We want to know who you are, right? People want to know that they're wanted and almost uniformly small scale manufacturers do not know that anybody wants them to be there. So the more that you tell people what it is you're looking for and, and who you want, the more you will find them. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, there are some questions. Um, I just was looking at one um, about kind of uh, resources for investment. Um, so you're talking about kind of redirecting resources from the old model to the new model, kind of obviously the large scale almost to the small scale. <clears throat> what exactly are you talking about resource wise and where can kind of folks look for more resources for that in their communities? Absolutely. So we impact the price of space and the, and the, invest, the capital investment in businesses in a million different ways in, in, all, in our economic development decision making and in our planning decision making. Um, the systemic racism that is in our country is in fact baked into almost every one of those decisions um, and really peeling it back and saying, how are we redirecting how money gets spent out of our economic development authority? Does the economic development authority only invest in businesses that have a hundred jobs or more? Is there a way to take a bunch of that money and say, okay, we're going to invest in small businesses? Um, the local CDFI, um, do you have a CDFI? Is there one in the region that you can bring in that can create, that can provide loans to businesses that might not be bankable, um, that might be as low as $5,000 or even less 
um, to give businesses that opportunity to buy the supplies that they need to start selling a product, um, which is often a, a really big hurdle for these businesses. Um, but also looking at investment in space, in the space and in the real estate. What are the incentives that the community gives to people doing development, both rehab and new construction? If rehab in many cases can be lower cost spaces in a lot of communities, how do we create incentives that help people do more rehab versus the new construction so that we have affordable spaces? Um, what, are the, what are the incentives that we give in the community are, are a huge uh, investment. Um, and then directly into the, the small scale manufacturing businesses themselves, a lot of times the biggest barrier for them is affordable um, rehabbed workspace. Um, it's not necessarily the capital costs for a, a big machine. Eventually businesses get to that barrier and then something like a CDFI or a partnership with local banks um, can really make a big difference as well. How do you feel about the concept of a business incubator when it comes to manufacturing? I think well, there's incubators and there are accelerators. So incubators are often the nonprofit that has some kind of investment from a foundation or the jurisdiction. Um, and an accelerator takes investment in the business, right? Um, I think they're both great models. We have very few of them for small scale manufacturing businesses. In fact, we have very few startup programs um, specifically for product businesses or non-tech uh, there are a bunch that are now starting to float around the country like co-starters, um, but um, there are very few programs that really help lo business people launch businesses that way. Um, and there are even fewer that help the established ones scale. Um, there are very few programs nationally that help you take an established small business that's been around for anywhere from a few years to, to decades, but really figure out how to scale it unless it's already um, big and part of a, you know, multi-million dollar program um, that they can be a part of. So especially those businesses that are under a million dollars um, or even under $250,000 in revenue, there's very little to support them. So I think incubators as well as accelerators um, because really serve a very important part of that. Um, we have all of those things, in fact, on Main Street in a lot of communities, but focused on tech. And so the question is, how mm -hmm. can we redirect that um, to small scale manufacturing. There are small scale manufacturing businesses that are also high growth, just like tech businesses, um, but they don't have the same ecosystem infrastructure that we have for tech. So a lot of it is learning from tech and applying it to these other sectors as well, and actually getting people to invest in those spaces. So in some cases, the large manufacturers that might be in a region might invest in something like that, both for workforce development purposes, as well as pipeline. Um, people who can create some of their supply chain things. Yeah, and that almost speaks to kind of the concept you were you were you were talking about earlier in terms of the intentionality of the investment and trying to really kind of direct the investment and the growth towards outcomes that you want to see. Um, I have a question about that in terms of kind of the ROI of mm -hmm. those types of investments. Are we seeing? Um, well, I'll rephrase it. I know that in many of the kind of incremental development, kind of small scale stuff we've talked about at the CNU kind of world, we talk about how the ROI locally is so much more because of the wealth building and, you know, the knowledge building. Right. Do you have stats on kind of the ROI of investing in manufacturing? Like, does it even matter? Can we just kind of say that, you know, it's the intentionality of the investment and the growth matters so much more? Do you have thoughts on that? I don't have stats um, on that off the top of my head, but I, there are a couple of things to keep in mind. One is that um, ground floors of, of businesses or of, of buildings that have, that are unique, um, that really showcase what is unique about the community. Um, that's something that the big developers spend a lot of money on doing. Um, and mm -hmm. so when we can do that in our incremental projects, um, then we have that ability to really make a property stand out. And so a lot of times, they may not make the ROI on that ground floor. They might make it because that ground floor has made the building so cool that it increases the revenue that they get upstairs. Um, and really thinking about that investment almost as an amenity for the project is what we see a lot of developers starting to do. Hmm. That's interesting. Um, are there other things that you kind of wanted to get at? Um, I know you have like a hundred million angles you come at this from, but I feel like I've asked you most of the key questions that I kind of jotted down. Um, do you um, have other 
Wanna... Yeah, absolutely. I think that, you know, one of the things, that, I know one of the questions that came in was specifically about model ordinances. Um, if people are interested in the, the artists and manufacturing land use, Nashville has a really good example. Um, if you don't see it easily by doing a search, just shoot me an email at ilana at recastcity.com um, and I'm happy to, to pull the link for you. Um, Nashville did it and then a whole bunch of communities have copied it. Um, Fairfax County, Virginia um, did it at a county level. It's a slightly more complex um, land use definition um, just because of the process that they had to go through. Um, but each of these just made it really easy for businesses to start being able to be in, in really any kind of commercial space and have been copied in a lot of times um, in a lot of places. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that there, there is a real struggle that's going on in a lot of communities that I think we're going to unfortunately see a lot more of that. And that's lit, property owners sitting on vacant property. There is a lot of, there are a lot of communities that I've spoken to where um, parts of Main Street or parts of downtown are owned by investors from really far away. Um, and they're honestly taking the property as a loss very purposefully. Um, so they've established a lease that they'll lease it for that's actually pretty high. Um, and without anyone who can afford that, they'd much rather just take it as a loss on their taxes. And so there are a whole bunch of solutions around that um, in terms of vacant property or ordinances. Um, I think DC has one, a couple of other communities have them so that um, there's actually a pretty hefty fee if you're leaving a storefront, especially in the downtown, um, if you're leaving a storefront vacant. And I think those are really important to think about because it is, we know that it is essential to, to fill those storefronts um, so that we can create that energy and, and really not have a negative impact on the neighboring pro properties and the neighboring businesses as well. Mm. Um, and so um, I think it, it, especially with these, this potential closing of a lot of, of restaurants and retail, small scale manufacturing businesses can really be a part of the solution, even as an interim solution to say, let's take five years and, and lease it out to small scale manufacturing to keep the spaces in use. Um, there was a really interesting, um, I'm trying to remember what it was, um, Los Angeles. One of the improvement districts in Los Angeles actually um, created a partnership with a whole bunch of, of property owners uh, in the improvement district who had vacancies. Um, who's, and they, the property owners in general said, well, we just can't find anybody for our space. And what the improvement district did is they created a partnership with all of those different, a number of different property owners at a time and said, let us pay you a flat fee, something like $700. It was, not, it was nothing of, of consequence, right? As, as, a, as a use fee um, and we'll do a six month pop-up in it. Um, and what they found was that by using the space for a pop-up and the, the improvement district vetted the, the, the businesses to go into the pop-up, they had this big competition. They really worked very purposefully mm -hmm. to make sure it was a diverse community of business owners that got access to the spaces. Um, they had some funding I think available for folks to really make the, the basic space vanilla um, and to be able to operate it, a uh, warm vanilla box out of that space. And, but what they found um, is that once the space was occupied, all of a sudden the landlord would, you know, the property owner would reach back out to them and say, I don't know what's going on. All of a sudden I'm getting inquiries on this property. And it's because the space had been activated, right? It's sort of an obvious aha, um, but I think it, it really does make sense to be able to say, how do we start creating these longer term, six months, one year, you know, pop-up uses or temporary uses so that we can bring energy back to these, these places. Yeah, Detroit did a similar kind of, uh, they called it Motor City Match, but it was a use of CDBG block grants to, um, you know, do vacant spaces with potential entrepreneurs and connect those folks. And I thought that was a really um, unique program. Yeah. I love that program. And the other thing to think about in all of this is how many businesses might be moving home. So we have this, I think, very bizarre bias against home-based businesses in a lot of communities. When I work with economic development um, offices or authorities, a lot of times they're not interested in home-based businesses, even if they're full-time, um, because they say if they're not in bricks and mortar, then they're not going to be our priority. Yet those are the businesses that will come back into our bricks and mortar in the future. Um, and with um, most of the storefronts either needing to be closed down or only partial in their opening, I know of a number of business owners that are saying it doesn't make sense for us to retain our bricks and mortar space. We're going to move it all home, even if it's being produced in a number of different homes. 
Um, mm -hmm. And then we'll come back maybe into storefronts when it's in the future. I think it's really important for jurisdictions to think about how not only are we allowing home-based businesses, um, but how are we supporting them? Um, and that's not about, you know, I know a lot of places design live workspace very purposefully, um, but that sometimes gets really expensive um, in, a, in designing that for spaces. So how are we just do, sort of doing that home-based business opportunity just as, a, as an automatic opportunity as well? Mm -hmm. um, that's great, thank you. Um, there are some questions kind of specifically about zoning and, and, and codes. Um, I know that we kind of have had a number of discussions about like nuisances, about you know production and manufacturing. Um, right. And I can imagine that if you took this to like your neighborhood group and you could hear some people fighting about it, um, what are, are your kind of best practices around kind of defining ours and businesses in a zoning code? And also kind of what are your, how do you weaponize people who want to advocate for this? <laughs> A great question. Um, I always give it a face, right? I mean, as you guys saw in my presentation, this is people, and this is about people with businesses in our community. Um, and so, to me, that that's always the basis of the discussion, no matter what I'm talking about. Um, in terms of the really specific language within a zoning code, um, I just look at. I mean, the Nashville land use definition. What they did is they just they amended the the zoning code to add a land use definition. And then they just checked it off into the different zones, right? So that they could just do it as simply as possible. Um, and, and some of the artisan manufacturing definitions, they have a maximum square footage. And so that's how they're controlling for some of those issues. Um, in some of them, they have a specific no, noise or odor piece that says that it's not to exceed whatever the noisiest or smelliest thing that's already allowed in that code. Um, but a lot of times it's also just about being really purposeful about um, the storefront and, and, you know, if there's a business improvement district or a Main Street coalition in that community, really recruiting businesses that are consumer facing, that want to be a part of the community, that really want to have a, a storefront, even if it's only the first, you know, seven feet of the store, there's still a place that people can come in, they can interact with a the person, there is that energy or that they put a, a means of production in that front window. I always talk about, um, I feel like this is in a lot of places, right? The, the chocolate maker or the, or the pizza shop where you can ha look through the window and see the people you know, spinning the, the crust, the dough and, and putting things on it. People love seeing stuff made. It's actually a huge attraction. Um, and so yeah. how are we using the making of stuff as the thing to enliven that storefront window? Yeah, that's really great, thank you. I I live in a kind of art focused community and there's a, a art studio down the street that's in an old fire station. And whenever the, the doors are up and people just stop and stare. <laughs> oh yeah, no, it's amazing. And it's, and it, it's, a, it's a point of pride, right? You, you see people in your community yeah. making things and it, it helps you believe in your community. Um, and a lot of places honestly need help believing again. And so I think we have a, especially with incremental development, um, and any kind of community investment that we're pursuing, I think we have a, a really a wonderful role that we can serve in helping to rebuild that. Yeah, that's a really wonderful sentiment. Um, thank you. Um, so I'll ask you just kind of as a closing question, um, you know, you're speaking to an audience of new urbanists, of CNU folks. What is kind of the one thing that you feel like new urbanists need to know or should be doing starting now? Um, bake small scale manufacturing businesses into your projects. As a designer, as an architect, as a planner, as a developer, whatever role you're serving in new urbanism um, for your community, go and talk to the businesses, go track them down and, and ask them what kind of space do they need? What are their barriers that they face? And really figure out how to bring them into the projects um, and talk to people about it. Be excited about it to other people so that you can really share this idea with people that this is a great opportunity moving forward. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much. Thank you everybody who attended. Um, this has been a wonderful discussion. Um, the recording of this will be available on CNU's website within 24 hours. Um, also, my colleague Claire has posted in the chat a link to a feedback form if you guys have any feedback about this session or any other session or ideas about future sessions, we'd love to hear them. And thank you guys so much for all your time. And thank you, Alana, for joining us. Thank you very much. All right, have a great day.